Good morning and welcome to the Japan Society's weekly webinar. I am Bill Emmett and I have the honor and pleasure of chairing the Japan Society. Let me once again thank all the Society's members and friends for your continued support during these difficult times for all of us and for your regular attendance at many of these webinars and at the Society's other cultural events. This is the 16th in this series that we began in early April and will be the last before we take a summer break and return in September. We've covered many topics and I would welcome all your suggestions for topics that we should be looking at from September onwards. But for me, as some of you know, today's issue of gender equality and diversity in the workplace is especially important, especially for the future of Japan, but also for the UK. Because, it's a, because of its significance in what is and what may not be changing in Japan, it is a topic on which I have been doing my own personal research. Indeed, shamelessly, I should mention that I have a new book out in English in September called Japan's Far More Female Future, and will be planning my own talk for the Japan Society on the issue during the autumn. But today, we have two real experts on the issue in both the UK and Japan to, see, to speak about it. Neither country has a lot to boast about on gender equality. Only today I read an interview with the former Conservative Minister, Amber Rudd, lamenting the lack of women in senior positions in the UK government and claiming that the Prime Minister, quote, feels more comfortable with men, a familiar lament in both countries. Briefly, the background data is like this. There are many ways to measure the gender gap, but the World Economic Forum's annual gender gap index does as comprehensive a job as any. In their 2020 report, published at the end of 2019, the UK ranked, ranked 21st out of 153 countries on the index, while Japan ranked a lowly 121st. The UK rated highly on equality of education and health, a bit less well on economic participation and poorly in politics, as Amber Rudd noted. Japan rated also highly on health, but a bit lower than the UK on equality in education, certainly lower on economic participation, and very poorly in politics. There are many ways, in particular, to measure shares of leadership positions, but on the World Economic Forum's definition, in Japan, women oc occupy 14.8% of leadership roles, whereas in the UK, they occupy 36.3% of such roles. One important factor on leadership in Japan, in my view, is that gender inequality in tertiary education for today's leadership generation, those who studied at university during the 1980s, was extremely wide. More than 35% of boys but fewer than 15% of girls attended full four-year university courses. So the pipeline of potential female leaders is limited. Britain went through that sort of elimination of the tertiary education gap at least a decade sooner than Japan did. In Japan, during the 1990s and beyond, this changed not quite to the complete equality now seen in the UK in tertiary education, but with 50% of girls studying at four-year courses and 55% of boys, so a much narrower gap than in the past, and the pipeline in future generations should be much larger. But how to turn potential into actual? That is the topic for today and also the background to the launching of the 30% Club, first in Britain in 2010, now globally, and with its Japan chapter being established in May last year. The 30% target related both to board directorships and to senior management. In Britain in 2010, just 12.5% of board seats at the biggest, i.e. FTSE 100 companies were held by women. Now, the figure is more than 34%. Japan has a similar starting point, but a decade later. 10.5% of Topics 100 board seats were held by women in 2019, up 2.5 points in one year, and far higher than the 4% seen in 2014. So what can now be done? What mix of persuasion, education, and other pressure really works? And what are the benefits? To discuss this, I'm delighted to welcome two leading figures from the 30% Club, past and present. 
in the UK, I welcome Heather McGregor, one of the founding forces behind the 30% Club. Heather is now Executive Dean of the Edinburgh Business School, part of Harriet Watt University, but many of us know her first for having written a column for the Financial Times called Mrs. Money Penny's, Penny's Letter from Tokyo when she was working there in finance, and then in London when she was CEO, now chair, of the Taylor Bennett executive recruitment firm. And in Tokyo, I welcome Yoriko Goto, who is chair of the Deloitte Tomatsu Group and vice chair of the Japan chapter of the 30% Club. Goto-san has many years of experience in public accounting and was the first female appointed to Deloitte Japan's board of directors. Both of our speakers will open with 10 minutes of remarks, following which, as usual, we will have a discussion and, most important of all, your questions. As before, please submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. This week, as the 30% Club was created in Britain, I'm going to ask Heather McGregor to begin. Over to you, Heather. Thank you very much, Bill. And um, it's really lovely and a great honour to be with the members of the Japan Society. Um, I have lived and worked in Australia and Hong Kong and Singapore um, and Tokyo. And I can honestly say that the only country that I ever left in great sadness and wishing I could stay was Japan. Um, and I had visited many times before I went to live there. It was my dream to go and live in Japan. Um, and when I finally was posted there in 1998 by ABN AMRO, um, it, was, it was honestly one of the most special parts of, of my life. Um, and before I fast forward to 2010, which is when we set up the 30% Club and speak briefly about you know, what we were doing with that and, and how we were um, doing it. And, and as Bill said, what works? <laughs> um, because there's, it's very, very important that you do things that work. And believe me, some of the things that we tried didn't work. Um, I just thought I would just share with you a little bit about um, how things have changed uh, over the time since we set up the 30% Club. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, and so this is a bit of technology that we have to hope for the best here. Um, so, um, let's make sure this works. Bill, can you just tell me as soon as you can see the screen? Yes, I can see it. That's perfect. Lovely. So this won't take very long because I don't want to um, blind people with science, but I just thought for old time's sake, I would, um, uh, I would, oh, I would move, I can't seem to share my screen, but not to actually move, move the, um, oh, there we go. Um, I would share a picture of me printing my column. So for those of you who ever read Mrs. Moneypenny in the Financial Times, and um, and it, which was originally entitled, as Bill said, email from Tokyo. I started writing that column. I wrote it for 17 years, but the first two years of it were from Japan. And um, somebody took a picture of me writing my column one day in a Royokan um, up on the Noto Peninsula. And so I thought I would start by remembering the days when I looked 20 years younger. I was 20 years younger and I was writing 900 words a week for the Financial Times which they interestingly didn't actually print or publish it in the Japan edition. You could only read that column if you lived in the United Kingdom. Um, and I, 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 my roots of the 30% Club actually were in that column because when the Financial Times rang me in Japan to ask me to write a column, they rang and asked me to write 900 words every week on gender in the workplace. So 20 years ago, this was an issue. Um, and I declined to write about gender in the workplace because in my view at the time, I didn't have an issue. Um, I, I was you know, living and working in Japan. I was um, a, a full-time employee of a bank and had been sent to Japan, which is a very male culture, as we all know. Um, but, but that hadn't stopped them sending me there and making me the deputy CEO of the whole office, of the whole investment bank. And also as my male boss spent most of his time on the golf course, um, I just, you know, I basically was in charge for, for the whole time that I was there. And I didn't, the other thing I had in that, in that particular job was the most successful person on the sales floor was a woman, was a Japanese woman. And so I had the most amazing role model. Her name was Yoshi Kitagawa. 
and she was um, hugely successful at broking uh, European stocks into Japanese fund management houses. And so I, I really didn't have um, any lack of support, I didn't have any lack of, uh, of role modeling from Japanese women there. So that, that, from my own personal experience, was very positive, but I appreciate that it's not really like that. And I looked back at my columns when I was preparing for this talk, and to my absolute horror, I discovered that 20 years ago in Japan, looking at my notes from my, my, my life at that time, it was in those days, um, it, it, it was, there were overtime prescriptions for women. There was a limit to the number of overtime hours that a woman could work, but not a man. So you'd, it, you know, even in the employment law that existed then in Japan 20 years ago, there were all sorts of restrictions on women that didn't exist for men. And it, 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 this, this, I mean, I'm looking back at these notes now in absolute horror. I don't know how I, how I thought that was completely normal. Um, but it, it, it occurred because one night when I was working my way through the bonus um, uh, allocations for all the people in the investment bank, my HR lady told me she had to go home. And I said, why do you have to go home? She said, because I've reached the limit of the overtime hours I can do. Um, and you know, if you would had a male HR manager, he could have stayed here and helped you. So, I, I mean, I just, just thought this was quite extraordinary. Um, I, I also, you know, was in those days, I was writing um, observations about, you know, the, the different roles of, of men and women um, and, um, and reading. Um, I did actually publish all my columns in one book called, called Email from Tokyo. And um, so looking back in, in that, I also noticed that I was very struck by uh, what is a Japanese wife? What, is it, what are the cultural embodiments of a Japanese wife, which I was told was a Yamato Nadejiku, no, I can't pronounce this, actually we should get uh, Goto-san to tell me how to pronounce this, Yamato Nadejiku, is that right? It means uh, uh, the cultural requirements of a Japanese wife. And um, I asked a Japanese colleague what this meant, and she said, it's a woman who can understand a Japanese man who has a Yamato Damashi uh, spirit, and who is quiet, patient, supportive, a woman who always behaves in an elegant way and gracefully, who never complains about men's attitudes. Um, so you can see I wasn't a very good Japanese wife, uh, um, uh, generally, and certainly at work. Um, but I found that all completely fascinating. Moving on to 2010, um, I, uh, together with one of my friends, a lady called Helena Morrissey, who was in those days the CEO of Newton Investment Management, which was a department of the Bank of New York. Um, she called 50 of us, five zero of us together for lunch in the August of, um, uh, of 2010. And she told us that as Bill mentioned, 12.5% of the seats on the boards of the FTSE 100 were women. That was not actually the shocking statistic. The shocking statistic was that nothing had changed for 10 years. So if you had looked in 2000, the very year when I was complaining about women not being able to do overtime in Japan, um, in 2000, 12.5% of women on the board of the FTSE 100 were, uh, were, were, board were, men, were women. So nothing had changed in 10 years. It wasn't that, that that was a shocking statistic. It was that the statistic had existed and nothing had changed. And so Helena called us together and said, we've got to do something about this. Otherwise, there will be a law. And I think this is the part of the 30% club that matters to me most, is that we don't have the situation as in Norway or France or Italy, where the number of women are prescribed by law. Um, and I don't personally believe in quotas. I think they are a very good way of, uh, the threat of quotas is a very good way to get change, but I don't believe in quotas because if you have a situation like Norway, then when a woman is put on the board, they usually say, oh, well, you know, they had to do that because it was the law. And so that woman is not there through merit. So I believe that we need to, to not have quotas and women should be there on their own merit. And so does Helena believe that. So she got 50 of us together and said, right, I'm setting up a group to agitate for change. Um, how many of you are in? Now this was 50 women that she had brought together and only 12 of us stayed behind at the end of the lunch and volunteered to help. And it was a dozen of us uh, back then, and we set about the task of trying to change people's minds. Um, we didn't get very far to start with, and um, it was actually only until we asked some men to help. And this is a little known 
uh, factor uh, that we we went out and we thought right we haven't got very far helena was writing letters to chairman that were getting at best a, a, a patient reply and at worst some very rude replies or no reply at all um, and we could see that nothing was going to change so we thought about the two chairmen that we felt were sympathetic to the cause in the FTSE 100 and we asked them to get involved in getting people on board and they were Swain Bischoff who at that time was the chair of Lloyd's Banking Group and Sir Roger Carr who in those days was the chairman of Whitbread and is now the chairman of British Aerospace and these two men helped us and we drew up a spreadsheet and they got a couple of other chairmen to come and join them as well. Um, and we drew up a spreadsheet and we had a list of all the chairmen in the FTSE and we asked these, these two chairmen to ring all the other chairmen in the FTSE or contact them. And we ran a spreadsheet which allocated how well everybody knew them. So the, the, the final two categories of this spreadsheet was I know them well enough to phone them so that was then we definitely allocated that chairman to that person or I know them well enough to phone them at the weekend. That's the ultimate test. Do you know somebody well enough to phone them at the weekend? And if you did, then we got you to make the telephone call. So it was those four male chairmen, who, the two original ones and two that we got afterwards, that helped us and started to make it acceptable to align with the 30 percent club. The second thing we did, which was at the suggestion of Martin Gilbert, another man, um, at our first anniversary in 2011, when we were um, rather sad about uh, how little progress we'd made, Martin Gilbert said, why don't you get together all of the asset management industry representatives and form a lobbying group of the 30% Club in, um, Investment Committee um, and get them to help you. And so we did that, and that was a very powerful force for change. And that was led by the then head um, uh, of uh, invest of um, investor engagement at Jupiter Asset Management, Emma Howard Jones, um, who is Emma Howard Boyd, who is now actually the chairman of the Environment Agency in the UK. So she she was really very instrumental in getting us going. So what happened then? So what happened then was that in my research, I track the impact and the um, and the effect of women. In, in positions of governance. And this is what the pattern looked like in of the top 350 companies in the UK uh, in 2010. And those companies, the, the basically, the, these are all the directors of those companies. And these are the top 350 companies, not just the 100. But the people in the middle are more or less the 100. And um, they were very isolated 100 from the rest of the company. And as time went on, and more and more women were appointed, what you can see happening is actually this position in the middle gets uh, it gets positioned in a different way and also people start to come together in a major way. And women form a different brokerage use and they form a, a different means of, um, of connecting companies than men. And we've shown this um, in, with algorithms and we've shown this effect, um, effectively in so many ways. So I think women make a really big difference I've shared with you some of the things that work and some of the things that don't. And as I said, it's been a great privilege to be able to talk to you. I will now stop sharing my screen. Thank you very, very much, Heather. Um, someone has immediately asked a question, which I am going to lob back to you. That was a wonderful um, uh, um, tour de force on how it all happened and what, what you did. In those graphs, could you just explain to the audience um, in that representation of where of the of how it evolved over time, what is the graphic actually representing? How do you how would you just explain that graphic to the audience? The graphic is representing how the companies, our biggest companies, are connected to each other. So every dot on those graphs is a person who is a director of a company. If it's a red dot, it's a woman, and if it's a blue dot, it's a man. And you, it, it's too small because I've put it on a screen and we're all watching it on a, on a, you know, on a, um, a, a on a laptop or whatever. It, it, it's you can't see the the real movement in the colour, but but first of all, the colour changes quite substantially over time, and secondly, 
the way that companies are connected with each other and partner with each other um, changes as more and more women are appointed. They connect bigger and smaller companies. So the FTSE 100 stopped being a little club on its own in the middle and, um, and, and just the same people rotating around. And women bring genuine diversity and genuine connections across the, the business divide between larger and smaller companies. And that, that is incredibly helpful for particularly, for instance, for transferring best practice. If I just give you one very quick example, which is that I am chair of a risk committee on one public company and the other public company that I'm on the board of, which is in America, did not have, and it's a much bigger company and it didn't have a very good risk framework. So I took the risk framework from my small company in the UK that was very well managed and I delivered it in the US to my US company. And women are much better at doing that kind of thing we've seen than men are at transferring knowledge. Excellent, thank you very much. I think what we might do is get your slides after this presentation and circulate them because the colors didn't quite come through so well on Zoom, but I think they will better on, on email. So we will, we will do that because that's a very powerful representation. Now, um, over to Tokyo, to uh, Yoriko Goto, um, to hear uh, how, how, how do things look to you now one year on from the launch of the Japan, Japan chapter? Okay. Thank you, Bill. And good morning and a good evening. Uh, it's my great pleasure to join the discussion with you today. And I'd like to thank all of you who are joining this webinar for your interest in this important topic, gender equality. Before I talk about the 30% from Japan, let me start with talking about why I make efforts to tackle this gender parity issue. First, because it's about fairness. People should be treated fairly and equally. In reality, women in Japan carry too many things on their shoulders with very little help. Sometimes women hesitate to take chance at work considering their responsibility at home. That's not fair. Second, gender parity is a very important strategy for business. We are in a war fighting for talent. Inclusive culture and diversity are two of the most important factors for our success in hiring and retaining highly talented people. Also, diversity in the decision-making body is critical to appropriately manage the risk, avoiding groupthink. Lastly, it's absolutely important for Japan and Japan society whose working population, population has been rapidly shrinking. Women are the largest population who could be utilized more for business. Also, diversity is very important to accelerate innovation, which is really needed for Japan. Okay, uh, let's move on to the 30% club Japan. The Japan chapter of the 30% club, we call it 30% club Japan. Uh, it was launched, uh, as uh, Bill I also told us, the launch in May 2019. The goal of the 30% Club Japan has been set to reach 30% representation of women in senior management role in Topics 100 companies by 2030. As of now, 46 members joined this campaign. Out of the 46, 15 are the CEOs or chairs of Topics 100 companies. The club is supported by some powerful advocates, such as Director General of um, Gender Equality Bureau, the Cabinet Office, the FSA, the METI, and other opinion leaders. In December of last year, we entered a cooperation agreement with Kay Danden. Uh, Japan Federation of Economic Organization on promoting women's empowerment. So, how did we launch the 30% Club Japan? Well, I have a story. To be honest with you, I once failed to launch it about six years ago. One of my colleagues who was heavily involved in the 30% Club UK suggested me to launch it in Japan. So I made some soundings to see if we could gather a small group of Japanese CEOs and chairs 
to agree to work on this. But unfortunately, all responses I got were negative. So it wasn't the time yet. Then, why and how we tried it again? In 2017, Michiko Tadamasu, a senior manager at our consulting practice, had a chance of learning about the 30% club. She was struck by the club approach and immediately contacted the UK headquarters and told them that, I want to do this campaign in Japan. So then it circled back to me. So I was moved by her enthusiasm and we started working together to launch it. Michiko, uh, who was named as the founder of 30% Club Japan and the campaign manager, has been strongly supported and helped by the UK headquarters. We are also supported by BCCJ, the British Chamber of Commerce in Japan. I mainly worked on recruiting Japanese CEO and chair. Although I got some strong hesitation to join up, but I also got some very positive reaction. Some CEOs immediately agreed to join us, or even they contacted us to join. That was a nice surprise to me. Then, what has happened? What changed in the past several years? Um, if I ask understanding, first, the Japanese government has started seriously promoting empowerment of women as a part of its growth strategy. And, uh, the corporate governance code of Japan has been amended to encourage listed companies to appoint at least one female director in the board. The second point is the global movement of ESG and SDGs initiative. They have been driven by the government in Japan first, but more importantly, many Japanese companies pay a lot of attention to those initiatives and agree with the concept. Also, the stewardship call implemented by institutional investors in Japan and, and other countries, of course, strongly enhance their engagement activities. Those investors ask more questions and request more disclosure to companies, including diversity matters. Those together create the momentum to encourage the female empowerment among large companies. So 2019 was the right timing to launch this campaign. Although it looked, uh, took much longer than Michiko originally expected. So then I'd like to talk about uh, the uniqueness of Japan campaign. The basic approach of the uh, Japan campaign is the same as uh, that of UK. The members are the top management and co commit to take action to accelerate the changes and uh, activities of working group which involve the stakeholders and create movement. Adding to that, in Japan, we organize the topic member meeting, which uh, members are limited only to chairs and CEO, CEOs of topics to listed companies. In this working group, they are discussing seriously about how to bring the women in decision-making bodies and accelerate gender diversity. So not only do they discuss initiatives for their own company, but they also started leadership program for their company's female successors. Uh, to uh, share their views and to extend horizontal relationship beyond their own company. And chairs and CEO, CEO also have started to use their voice to uh, work not only their company, but also to make an impact on the whole Japan business society. These leaders believe that Japan will not survive if Japan doesn't uh, transform its monoculture to a culture that values diversity. I count a lot on this working group. Um, then uh, let's, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the topic on the diversity and COVID-19. Uh, in this unpredictable period of time uh, for the economy and the financial market, 
business leaders are working extremely hard to survive. So I hear some concern that the focus on diversity and inclusion may have slipped uh, from the uh, executive's top agenda. So uh, but I rather focus on the bright spot. With COVID-19, businesses are keener to do the right things to do and are more conscious about the societal impact of their business. In addition, flexible working has become the new normal now. This change has opened the door with opportunities for people who would have found it difficult to relocate, travel, or work in different locations. So now we know they can work virtually beyond boundary wherever they want, whenever they want. So business leaders should have realized that this is a new opportunity of redesigning their resource model. To work through this crisis with resilience, we need to avoid group thinking, bringing the best minds and diverse thinking um, together in decision making is an important success factor. In summary, it's our responsibility as leaders to create an inclusive culture and society for making better decisions for a better future. That's all for me now. So back to you, Bill. Thank you very much, Yoriko. That was uh, wonderful. And um, I'm delighted that you're clearly making, uh, you and your colleagues are clearly making quite significant progress in, uh, in getting allies. Let me ask um, both of you about the point that, uh, that Heather raised, which was the role of the asset management industry of investors, I mean, of all the investment companies, which I think, as Heather said, was a very significant factor in the UK. Um, how is that working in Japan? I mean, one hears particularly about the, the, the GPIF, the Government Pension Investment Fund, the world's hugest uh, pension investor, talking about ESG. So when I then asked someone who was working for it, how is your gender equality uh, rating in terms of your own management, uh, they looked rather embarrassed um, and uh, they felt that they weren't doing very well. But are they actually putting pressure on and having an influence? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, I, I uh, uh, briefly mentioned about the ESG. Yes, uh, yes uh, our in this investor group is that the uh, most uh, actively uh, working, uh, uh, act, uh, active uh, working group in, uh, at the Society Passing Club Japan. And uh, uh, right now, the most of the uh, uh, influential uh, large uh, asset managers and uh, institutional, institutional investors are already the member uh, of the investor group. And uh, uh, they are working together to uh, 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 discuss about the better practice of the, their engagement and how to impress uh, uh, the company's uh, disclosure and uh, the company's diversity activities. And uh, they are uh, quite often um, issued a statement about the uh, importance of diversity and inclusion. Uh, so that is a very powerful uh, activity um, done uh, in, uh, in, in Japan. Uh, so I really value that this uh, work of the that group. And Heather, um, in uh, the the UK um, and well and around the world, because you're 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 looking at this in an international uh, way, um, are there it was some of these sorts of uh, efforts you get? they become fashions and then people's interest in them fades. Do you see the interest in gender diversity and, uh, and um, the issue among asset managers, uh, among investors still strong? And, um, or is it a, a, a thing of constantly rekindling it? Um, well, we do see it still strong, um, but it is true that if you don't keep something going, it will fade. And one of the perpetual things with the 30% club is that we have to keep renewing ourselves both in the UK and across the world. Um, what we have, there are a couple of things I would share that we've also found though that work with this. The first is that you have to measure. So my um, great mantra in life is that if you don't measure the things that you value, you will end up only ever valuing the things that get measured. Mm. And so if you want people to value something, then measure it. And, and make sure that the measure is reported. 
And so you, you need to get the number of, so we started off measuring the number of women in the FTSE 100, which is the 12.5% that we were talking about. But we've gone on to measure lots of other things, to measure the 350. We, um, there's a standing project at Cranfield, um, which is a university, a postgraduate university. Um, to uh, there's, a, there's a center there that publishes the stats every year. And so every year when the stats came out, we all made ourselves available to speak to the press and we had a well-organized campaign campaign to do that. I mean, I remain a lifetime ambassador for the 30% club and sat on its steering committee for eight years. And all we had to do was constantly this. So the oxygen of measurement is really important. And um, the second thing is, uh, is about term limits. So uh, I was very instrumental in setting up the 30% club, both in the United States and in Australia. And in United States, I couldn't understand why why things were not working at all. I mean, you would have thought that the United States is a place that they might not have had a woman president yet, but they're certainly quite far advanced uh, with women and jobs. But it's because the governance legislation is so far behind. In the UK, we have term limits for board directors. So you serve three years, you can be renewed for three years, you could potentially, if they want to renew you for a final three years, but after nine years, you are no longer considered independent and you have to rotate off. Now, this means that there is constant rotation on boards. Um, we also have, you know, uh, no chairman, chief executive, uh, joint posts or very few of them. Um, and the, this is all under what they call the combined code, which is the way that company governance is governed in the UK. Now, in America, there's no such thing as a term limit. They don't have term limits. So there are 500, the, the, if you look at all the companies in the S&P 500, um, only 30 of them have term limits, which are built into their own uh, articles of association. And can you believe it? One of those companies, their limit of how long you can serve on a board is 30 years. <laughs> I, I, I don't call that a term limit. And, um, so, you know, that means that, you know, 470 of the companies in the, um, in the S&P 500 don't have any term limits. There is nothing like that required. And so as a result, there isn't the turnover that you need if you want to get more new people onto boards. Um, the other thing that really works is um, having people to watch. So having lists published of women to watch, you know, identifying women coming up through the ranks and then publishing lists of these people all over the place. That, that is also, Cranfield do that too. That's very helpful. Uh, that, thank you. That uh, lots of data is something that is in the background of what um, Yoriko was saying also about the governance code in Japan, that um, although the, the, the government uh, has not kind of directly imposed targets or quotas or anything, it has required data disclosure. Uh, and publication, yes. which I think has been pretty important uh, in Japan. So in a similar in a similar way, you know, it's sort of an underrated, underestimated, realized. Um, yes, uh, especially, the, uh, I think Japanese companies are very serious uh, about the disclosure and the disclose uh, is a candidate. So I, I think uh, uh, raising the bar of the disclosure requirement works. So uh, we will try to. Um, uh, uh, engage with the government uh, promoting the importance of the uh, heightened disclosure requirement. Uh, we'll try. Now, I, I should move to some questions. There are lots of questions coming in. Um, Masako Iguchi Bacon has asked about um, smaller companies. Does the 30% club offer something for SMEs, both in the UK and Japan? 90% or more of companies are SMEs, and they are also important drivers of economy and society. Clearly, you can't do everything, and you can start with with the headline yeah. big companies. But uh, how do you think? How is the issue? Maybe starting with you, Yoriko San. Um, how is the issue seen in in uh, SMEs, in smaller companies? In, yes, uh, I agree. Um, I wish we could have um, uh, coverage for SME. Uh, the issue is uh, more serious there. Yeah. Um, but uh, as you just said, uh, uh, what we can do uh, is uh, limited. So uh, we uh, talked about our strategy and decided uh, to start from the most influential part. Uh, uh, we are not only uh, talking about uh, 
uh, diversity at the board level, but we are talking about uh, uh, changing Japan uh, culture and then uh, uh, making Japan at the more uh, uh, to be able to grow or, or uh, 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 avoiding shrinking, just shrinking business. So uh, we to to make uh, happen. Uh, I we thought that uh, just focusing the more power, uh, most powerful part of the business and let them change first, then. Uh, let, let them and uh, change the part to in, make influence in the other part of the business. So uh, it's a matter of the priority. And I do recognize uh, um, uh, what's happening in SME uh, in Japan is more severe. Um, yeah. uh, I have the data, uh, um, even for the uh, topic companies, uh, topic 100 companies, only 15 companies uh, don't have a female director out of 100 um, last year. So this year's uh, figure will be better, but uh, we are still uh, counting. And uh, about topics, uh, when we talk about topics 400, uh, 125 com companies still don't have a uh, female director. So then SMEs for that. So I, um, I think uh, uh, in the uh, time being, uh, we should uh, start focusing on that or uh, in, uh, we should uh, tackle with that uh, in other ways. Uh, but 30% uh, crowd uh, is a uh, priority in the larger company. It's a just a matter of that uh, strategy. Thank you. Now, Heather, the, the maybe Partly related to that question, but more broadly, uh, questions coming in about you know, working styles um, and the influence that that has on uh, on women's prospects. Um, Nicholas McLean has asked about uh, about you know the the Japanese tradition of uh, long hours after work, drinking and bonding, and so forth, which really is a question in the end about team building and management uh, structures in in a company. Uh, now, you know, one answer I always give to this is that, well, it's not as if people don't work long hours in, in companies in other countries. Um, it's, not, it's not a problem unique to Japan, but what's your perspective on that work style issue as far as the prospect of, of uh, getting women into uh, senior management positions are concerned and how it's, how it's affected? This is not unique to Japan. I know that everybody likes to talk about the Japanese culture of going out to um, bars and socialising and then falling asleep on the train on the way home. Um, but the real issue here is social capital. So women lack the social capital um, in many cases to, it's not just about um, what you know, it is about who you know. And for all of those people who think that that's unfair, um, I would say to you that um, if you've ever studied logic or philosophy, you will know that things have to be necessary and sufficient. And it is necessary to be good at what you do, but it's not sufficient. And you need to invest in something. If you've got a moment, you could look up something called the solo principle, which is the, the part of our economic expansion that is not accounted for by the factors of production. And it, it is the um, the, the know-how, if you like, the tacit knowledge. Actually, what, one of the leading scholars on this, and then Nakata is the is, is a um, is Nakata is the is, is a Japanese academic who's written about tacit knowledge and implicit knowledge. And you know, the thing about this kind of knowledge pass on and know-how, this actually happens when people meet together and talk, and they build social capital, and it is incredibly important because even now, even in the UK, you know what will happen is you will have people being selected for a board position and it will come down to two people maybe at the end of the day and then they will go around the table and say right who knows these people and if you have no um, if nobody's ever heard of you and then you've got to remember that an appointment is not a hiring decision it is a risk weighted investment decision and in order to weight the risk people look to someone vouching for you or saying that you're not going to come into this board and disrupt it or you're going to come in and you're going to make a contribution. And that needs people to know you. And women don't build their profile because here and in Japan and in other countries of the world, on the whole, women are doing care and responsibility. Japan has, and this was published in The Economist, this next statistic, um, 
the Japan woman puts in more hours outside the, you know, outside the workplace in the home than men on a ratio basis than any other country in the world. So the, the you know, it's not 50-50, believe me, even here. Um, I mean, even though I did get my husband to make me breakfast this morning, it's not even 50-50 in my house. So it is, you know, in, in the home, um, you know, women are doing an unequal share of the administration. And so they tend to go home off to work and do that administration and that caring and everything else rather than go out. And that's why they don't build the same social capital. That's not just Japan. That's everywhere. Um, I wrote a book called Careers Advice for Ambitious Women. The second chapter was called Build Your Social Capital, you know, and how to do it and how to go about it, even when you have caring responsibilities and you have um, and caring responsibilities aren't just about children, remember. They're about older parents. They're about, they're about having to pack up and leave your job when your husband gets posted abroad. There are lots of reasons why women don't get to invest in social capital the way that it is. And it is really important. How do you see, Japan, about um, the, the building of social capital for, for female professionals um, in the given, given absolutely what uh, what Heather's the reality of that what Heather Heather has written about family responsibilities about behaviour in work and to some degree in a question that Joy Hendry has asked about this about people's aspirations young how many young women in Japan and Britain actually aspire to uh, these positions of building social capital is a question that's often asked how do you see it currently in the new generation in in uh, Japan yes I'll. Uh... I think uh, the uh, new generation uh, uh, started to uh, work uh, the exactly the same way as uh, uh, men and women uh, the equally. Uh, but o over time, um, some women um, uh, drop out uh, from the course um, because of the many reasons. Uh, the one is uh, um, the responsibility of the uh, householding and uh, lack of the support uh, from their husband. But in younger generation, it has dramatically changed. Uh, they do work together and share the responsibility. Um, so the in the generation, it's different and quite uh, dramatically changing. Uh, and now, younger generation, uh, men, even men re request us to uh, support more women um, or their wives, and sometimes they uh, wanna uh, take a parental leave, or uh, uh, they want to have the flexible working uh, because they want to uh, take care of their children. So the culture has been changing. Uh, the issue is a uh, uh, more senior uh, generation. So, uh, by the way, the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Act was enacted in 1986 in Japan. So, uh, since then, uh, women uh, were able to, on the surface, um, get a job uh, uh, at the same condition as men. However, uh, that was only just a uh, surface. They started uh, working as a uh, uh, the same as men, but job uh, because uh, I think uh, the largest um, reason was the uh, uh, culture of the company. Uh, Japanese company didn't change their culture. It's a monoculture, men's uh, uh, central century, and they didn't pay uh, enough attention uh, to women. Uh, so um, many women disappointed and left. So that, that's the reason why uh, we are not able to uh, build uh, enough pipeline or uh, other uh, future leaders of the uh, company uh, as women. So uh, we do have that issue uh, still, but I think uh, the uh, situation is getting better. Uh, the retention rate of women has been uh, improving, not yet uh, enough, but uh, uh, it's changing. Um, then one thing is that uh, uh, lifetime employment, uh, that is an uh, uh, issue uh, to speed up uh, the pipe building pipeline. Uh, if we stick with the lifetime employment, then uh, we, we need, they need to uh, wait too long, waiting for their time to step up. 
So I think uh, it's very important for Japanese companies to think about uh, changing the lifetime employment style to the uh, job description type uh, 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 style of the human resources. That's a very good point. Um, I've got a question from Yuichiro Nakajima about education. So obviously, Heather is in an educational inst institution nowadays. Um, education, as he says, must play a crucial part in changing attitudes, norms, and behavior. Uh, is the 30% club extending its reach to educational institutions from business schools to primary schools in Britain and Japan? I happen to know that Tokyo University is a member of the, 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 the Japan cha chapter of the 30% club, although their uh, ratio of, uh, of uh, both faculty and uh, female students is well below 30%, unfortunately. Um, Heather, let's start with you. What, were, what role can education play in this? Um, so the first thing that the Tech Club did when we got going was to encourage business schools to offer um, scholarships for women to do MBAs at the leading business schools. And so they're on our 30% uh, club scholarships for people to study at universities um, at the London Business School. The very first one actually was the Henley College of Management, which is part of the University of Reading now. They, uh, they came forward and offered it. Um, and I was a judge on those, in those early years. Um, and when, of course, I became a head of a business school myself uh, in 2016, when I became a professor, the first thing I did was to institute uh, scholarships for women to do MBAs. And we now run a scholarship for a woman in the UK, a scholarship in, um, in our campus in Dubai, and a scholarship in Malaysia. And of course, there are 30% club chapters now in those countries too. So the 30% club in Malaysia uh, chooses the winner there. And the 30% club in what they call the GCC, the Gulf, the Gulf States, chooses the winner there. Um, and we we have encouraged business schools to do that. There is still a um, still though an imbalance of women going to business schools. It is actually almost thirty percent. Um, but what we really want, of course, is fifty percent. And that's the other thing is when you measure things. Remember not just to measure the number of women. I, I read some of the questions as well. Some of the, about the women in the um, in the in the topics and so on. It's not the actual number of women in the, in the topics that matter. It's the rate of appointment. So out of how many vacancies are, are getting, of, of all of the appointments that were made in 2019, how many of them were women? And in order to move the percentage up, you need a higher rate of appointment, obviously. And, and so you need to watch the rate of appointment. It's a much more important figure to watch than the number of women on boards. No, you're right. That this um, relates to a question that uh, Yoko Dochi, who is a senior uh, female executive at SoftBank, um, has asked, putting in, uh, uh, being somewhat concerned about a, a lack of movement in the numbers. Um, I think that you're, you're commenting particularly in, for example, in Toyota Motor Corporation, female representation in mid-management, only 4.6%, um, pretty much the same as Bank of Tokyo uh, 30 years before, um, so not much progress. Uh, -San. And Dochi San herself is is somebody who is you know a huge and, and thank you for your contribution. It's it's good to have you here with us. Um, is a huge supporter of this work and um, and is herself a, a very good example. Um, uh, uh, as I said, I think having um, as is Goto San, you know, having women in those jobs. When you go back to social capital and women. Okay, it is not possible to become a partner at Deloitte unless you can prove that you have clients. And that you have built a pipeline of clients and clients have to support you and that's true of all of the big four and if you haven't built those relationships with clients you do not get to that job so you know it is it is ingrained in 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 people in certain professions to invest in their relationships with clients so that they will be supported for promotion but that's not true of course of lots of women who don't get that kind of support or don't get that kind of gu clear guidance you know if you don't do this this is what won't happen uh, I, I think it is so important to have uh, a role models and people ahead of you um, yeah that's true um, I am actually the first generation of the uh, female CPA um, then when I started working as a CPA auditor uh, uh, Many people, many companies are surprised to see women auditors. Uh, they've never seen that before. And uh, 
they didn't know how to treat me. And starting from that, uh, uh, I had very good journey, uh, including uh, rejected by the client uh, to work as a partner in charge of that uh, particular investment. But uh, uh, my partner, or my senior uh, ex executive leader, uh, so supportive that uh, uh, they uh, convinced uh, our client uh, to uh, work with me. Uh, and I worked very hard. Uh, I was able to get uh, uh, trust from the, those clients. So I was very lucky and happy. Uh, and my role uh, right now is uh, uh, that my uh, younger generation uh, avoid having that uh, kind of uh, experience. And uh, support and help them uh, working uh, very naturally, uh, equally. Uh, in, even in this profession. And, and Bill, you know, just one moment, one point on that to all of the women on this call. I mean, you, know, Madeleine Albright made a, her most famous quote, I think, is, is to say that, you know, this business about helping other people through in the way that Gota San was supported by her partner at the time, you know, that is so important. And when you get to the top as a woman, and you know, many people will, many women will, you know, their job is to turn around and help the people behind them. And it's Madeline awesome. Albright said there's a special place in hell for women that don't help other women. Yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but so I'm here and we, um, uh, many of my colleagues and um, uh, friends uh, and many companies, uh, women executives are here to help and strongly support younger generation. That is our duty and I feel I am responsible for that. Well, there's been a, a few questions. Uh, I can see one here from Philip Purvis. But there was another one earlier on as well about the role of government in this. Um, now, uh, Heather rightly said that the aim of the 30% club initially was to not have a law on things, but what can the government do? Um, as has been said, we've heard about the importance of the legislatory environment in the US and on this uh, governance codes in the UK. Um, what further things do you think, perhaps you, Yoriko San, first, can the government... Right. Um, we already talked about uh, governance code, the stewardship code, um, then uh, I, I think uh, uh, the governance, uh, government uh, will continue continuously support and do a better job uh, helping working mothers, um, providing more social support like uh, uh, elementary school or, or uh, uh, nursery. Or, uh, so we, we still, uh, 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 that, that support is not uh, enough yet. So uh, then uh, I think uh, the government may be able to enhance the disclosure, uh, I mean, requesting enhance the disclosure of the statics of the empowerment of uh, women uh, in uh, a business or uh, at the government. Um, uh, for example, uh, gender pay gap disclosures. Uh, in Japan, uh, not that disclosure is uh, even discussed yet. So uh, it, it's a quite uh, a distance from the, the uh, uh, activities uh, in uh, Europe. I understand that uh, the European government that is requiring uh, companies to disclose. disclose uh, Before asking Heather about government, I'm going to chip in and only add one tiny thing, which is to say about the national universities. Um, one issue I would suggest as an outsider is that uh, the female representation at national universities, including Tokyo University, is far lower than in private universities and in universities as a whole. Why? Well, one reason is because every exam has to, be, has to include science uh, STEM subject, uh, and school girls perform much less well on STEM subjects in Japan for all sorts of cultural reasons. Uh, changing that entrance exam requirement to be closer to that of private universities where you can take an exam in your major rather than in something that you're not studying, it would seem to me would, uh, would uh, make a big difference in national universities. But let me give Heather um, some last words because I'm running out of time, but uh, let me, let me ask, ask Heather what she thinks about government and its role. 
So I think it's very important to have um, a role for government, but I prefer not to see legislation. You know, I prefer to see um, more the kind of things that we have here, which is comply or ex or explain. And, you know, there have been subsequent uh, measures brought in more recently in the UK, for instance, on um, on gender gap on on reporting pay. We now have to all companies over 250 people have to report um, the gender gap in their pay and, and things like this. But this is brought through by comply or explain. So no one makes it um, compulsory for you to do it. But if you don't do it, you have to explain why you don't want to do it. And again, I would say that the oxygen of publicity um, uh, is the thing that will drive change. And so, ha so having reporting requirements, rather than saying you have to uh, have this many women, saying, could you please tell us how many women? And because then if you, if you have to publish your list of women, you will then be you know, called out if it's too low. And I think that you know, it's a bit like herd immunity for COVID-19. You need to get to a place, um, and this is what we did in the UK. We went from a place where chairman were saying, why should I? put another woman on the board to a place where they were saying, how can I? And that's, that is the change that we want on everything. Women in executive positions, women's pay, women's opportunities. Very well said, and that's a very fine way to uh, bring things to a close. Uh, Yoriko Sam, we are wishing you the greatest uh, strength to your elbow in, uh, in the efforts that you and the Japan chapter are doing uh, uh, in Japan. Um, and I think that uh, data, social capital, uh, and that uh, shift of mentality, as, you, as uh, Heather says, of uh, chairman and chief executives to how can I, away from why should I, is clearly going to be the, the measure for the future. But let me yes, thank, thank you. Very much. Yes, um, we do have a strategy to get to the 30%, so we will work hard to make it happen uh, by working uh, all together. Thank you. Excellent. Well, we will have regular uh, events, webinars to monitor the, the, the progress and to talk about it at the Japan Society. I'll make sure that that happens. Uh, but meanwhile, let me thank you, Yoriko Goto in Tokyo and Heather McGregor just outside Edinburgh, Edinburgh Business School, for sharing your time with us this morning. It's been a fascinating and uh, very in informative discussion about uh, what can change, what is changing and what should change. Uh, I thank all of the audience for taking part and for sending in your excellent questions. Um, and I thank you all for supporting the Japan Society during these difficult times, but also for attending so many of these webinars. Please send in your preferences for future topics. Um, I will jump to it and make sure that they happen. Uh, and um, meanwhile, I wish you all a very good summer and hope that many of you might come to our annual general meeting uh, next week also on Zoom. But meanwhile, thanks again to Heather McGregor and Yoriko Goto. Thank you. Thank you.